today, as many of you have requested, I have been joined by the awesome channel regular Roz and my good friend. Um, and we are going to talk about autism and friendship because, because we are autistic and also have a friendship. Isn't that nice? Yeah, for all of you wondering, we're still friends. We'll always be friends, won't we? Mm. Forever and ever and ever. Forever and ever and ever. You are never, ever, ever, ever going to leave me, are you? You literally cannot escape That's it. this friendship. This is a friendship for life. Okay. That's a threat. That's a threat. It sounds vaguely threatening, but also kind of comforting. <laughs> so I'm fine. I'm fine. I feel like within the context of our friendship, I've been able to do the most learning about friendship and unmasking. And that's one of the things we've both said that we enjoy about the friendship is it's given us a framework to learn how to have healthy boundaries and unmask and feel safe, yeah. right? And we've both kind of benefited from the fact that we are good enough friends that we've been able to push those barriers a little bit to see where they should be. And the, the biggest impact of masking on friendships, now that I have this friendship with you where I am largely unmasked and can therefore compare it to friendships where I'm somewhat masked and friendships where I'm very masked is the energy drain. That is the biggest issue for me. Yeah, so I like I definitely agree with the energy drain. I think the other thing is that um, when you're masking, you're not being yourself. And so then when that doubt creeps in that someone likes you, you've got this real evidence of, well, they just like the me I present as. Do they actually like me? And I think that can play a lot into the kind of insecurities. And then sometimes when you are like, you forcibly unmask, which might be because of like distressing emotions and people respond like, oh, like where did that come from? And then you're like, oh, they're his proof. They don't like me. They don't like the real me. They only like the me that I pretend to be. I need to pretend to be, be a person that isn't me. And then you're like, and then it doesn't feel like a friendship. And like, I have quite a lot of friends that I feel like have seen past my masking. Um, and like in my friendship with you, I feel like we've seen past each other's masking. And then sometimes it's like, oh no, you don't see past my masking. And the other one's like, no, I, I know that you're just putting that on. Now, when I'm with you, even if I fall into that, I can notice that I'm doing it and just stop. And that's, so we're, like, I wouldn't say like, I'm a hundred percent. I don't think, is anyone ever a hundred percent unmasked around anyone? I, I think probably, probably not all the time, mm. but it's nice to be able to realize while you're doing it, I don't, you don't need this. I don't need this. Why am I doing this? I could just stop doing it. Yeah. And I think there is a, like a, there are benefits to masking in terms of keeping yourself like protected, um, which people don't often talk about um, because it, 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 it is this double-edged sword of it can be protective but it can also be harmful and the, like it, it depends on the context and it can be both protective and harmful in a situation mm -hmm. um, so it's very nuanced. Nobody here is saying oh the the ideal for everyone that everyone should be looking to achieve is 100% unmasked all the time because like for the reasons that you've said but for me it's like yeah okay there's a benefit to me masking when I go and visit the doctor there's a benefit to me masking when I'm at work. If I'm having to heavily mask in order to be in a friendship, I would honestly rather be at home playing video games or baking cakes. Yeah. This is not, this is my leisure time. This is the time that should be largely fun for me and should fill me rather than deplete me. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm masking, I don't want to actually be doing it. That's the point that I have reached. I think my journey has been one of having a really large circle of friends, but being masked all the time to now having become quite antisocial because of recognizing that it's not fun for me to be masked around people and there is no obligation for me to be around them if that's how I feel. I think some friendships um, when you're like actively trying to unmask it's like actually I need to give this friendship a bit of space so I can come back to it and then and then start to unmask because I it's important to me but I need to figure out how to unmask in in a kind of invite in a different environment that's such a good point actually there's this feeling of first I'm learning to be unmasked on my own which is a big thing and takes a long time and then there's 
now I'm being amassed around the people that are very, very closest to me and then the wider circle. And even within that context, there's the, I can be a mass around you for an hour, but not a whole day. So it should be an hour to begin with, because that's how long I can sustain this. That anxiety about what someone will think of you, um, it can make unmasking a lot more stressful at first, like until you can identify, oh, I'm safe in this situation to unmask. For me, it's more noticeable after when I've been with a friend and I've been able to be unmasked, it's more of being at peace. Whereas when I've been with a friend, like a lot of times I've talked on these videos about the anxiety after social commitments, right? The anxiety of, did I handle that right? Did I say the right thing? Am I being judged? And honestly, I get that anxiety a lot more when I've been masked because I've just put on a performance that I'm then going home to analyze. Was it a <laughs> successful performance? Whereas when I've just showed up as myself authentically, well, that's who I am. So if I've not got it right, this is, you know, yeah. and that feels more peaceful and less frantic and horrible. Having friendships and maintaining friendships is another energy demand on your life, right? Do you have any thoughts, at, like particularly with your occupational therapy experience? Mm -hmm. Roz, if you didn't know, Roz is a qualified occupational therapist. Ooh. On how to kind of balance that with the other commitments in your life, like how to make that a positive thing, not something that feels like another job on your to-do list. Your friends will understand when you have a busy life and you can't put that energy in, particularly if you can communicate that and be like, actually this month is really busy, I'd love to see you, I can't right now. And then there's that other thing of, your friends will also have busy lives and things will go on at different points. And it's one of the things that can make it easier is finding ways to come together that don't deplete your energy. Um, so with some, friends like we co-work together we've also done things like just sit and watch tv and not really talk like and sometimes sit watch tv and play games on our phones and not talk to each other um, and that can like build up that energy level think about also the small things that you can do to communicate with a friend so we send a lot of gifts to each other so if we're particularly like depleted in energy but actually we really want that kind of social connection. We just send a gif of like whatever. Um, we send so many gifts to each other. We send so many gifts. <laughs> so I feel like there's lots of ways to connect, not all of which are as demanding as others. Mm. And it's okay to be honest. A more difficult thing that we've not really talked about when we've talked about friendship in the past is the vulnerability of being autistic or being ADHD or otherwise neurodivergent and how to know who to trust, I guess, and how to build, not just to know who to trust, but how to build trust gradually. What, what for you has helped you identify safer people? I know that I tend to fall hard and deep into a friendship because I love people. And when someone is like great, I'm like, they're so great. I love everything about them, everything about them. I, I make assumptions about everything about them based on what I do know about them. So one thing that I have learned that's really helpful is to build that relationship slowly and not rush it. Mm. What about you? Yeah, I'd say definitely like let things happen, like let things happen at their own pace. And like I do find that my brain races ahead and is like, I, there's a person and it's like, ah, oh, yeah, they're a great person. I want to be friends with them. And just like going, yeah, that's great. Take it a bit slower. Like it, it's okay to, you know spend a bit of time with them, see whether you enjoy the friendship. One of the other things is identifying like what you're getting versus what you're giving. And um, a thing that I learned like fairly in my, in my teenage years was it doesn't have to be that you give what you get. You can get different things from what you give. Everyone has different skills and what you bring to a relationship. It's not like, it's not like a present. It's not like a present, like I am giving you a present of this value with this content and you are gonna give me the same exact gift back. It's more like that you are invested equal amounts. I think that, let's just literally though talk for a minute about, and as horrible as it is, that there are some literal red flags. Like for me, one would be people asking you for money regularly. Yeah asking you to do things and when you say no kind of pushing you mm -hmm. to do something that you have like basically pushing down your boundaries yeah only kind of coming to you when they have problems 
and then when you try and contact them out like if you have a problem or you're just trying to get in touch they then don't respond to you yeah yeah that's that's a red flag that can happen for a sh- like in terms of the problem for a short amount of time if someone's really struggling it may be that all they do is come to you with problems and it's not great and that's not what you want um but if it's a friend that has previously not done that then that might be a different scenario but if it's a consistent pattern across the whole friendship then that kind of is much more of a red flag to me friendships like so much else that we live with in society are often defined within neurotypical or non-autistic standards and i personally am changing that for me um and and so let's talk about what that might look like and i would like to specify that i'm not just talking about autistic with autistic friendships being being able to be defined without neurotypical standards i'm talking about my relationships with non-autistic people as well so one of the things that i really like about some of my neurodivergent friendships is that we don't always need words to communicate like i've got a friend who i made recently who is also neurodivergent and part of the way our friendship started was sending each other pictures of mold and and I, I refer to it as a mouldy friendship. <laughs> Dancing, making weird noises, um, and not just accepting that kind of behaviour, but celebrating it and enjoying it for what it brings to the friendship. Enjoying autistic joy mm. and the expressions of autistic joy that might not be typical in a, like you say, not just accepting but celebrating. Isn't that a beautiful thing? One of the things that I've recognised I am lacking a little bit in my life is friendships where I share special interests. Because as close as we are, we don't actually have very many shared special interests. A lot of the things that you love are not things that I love and vice versa. And that's fine because we have this big shared special interest about brains. Mm. Um, So that is where we nerd out and share. But I'd like... I'd like some Lego friends. I'd like some Disney friends. Because I've realised that one of the things that I find difficult in friendships is how much of the content in a neurotypical relationship is around what's happening in your life, problems that you want to solve, and holidays you might be planning, and details like that, that I find processing those that information quite exhausting. So it's not that I don't want any of it, but it's tiring. I would like some friendships where we meet for coffee and literally just discuss what's happening in the Disney park, re certain attractions that are being renovated for an hour and maybe not even think about our own lives. That would be good for my brain. Hmm. You just got to hook the friends you have into your special interests. Like, you do want to go to Disneyland, don't you? Until they think, I do want to go to Disneyland. And I don't think I've got much hope of persuading you to be a massive Disney fan. So I'm not, I've not really tried. Well, like, it, it's more the roller coaster aspect of it. I don't go on roller coasters. I don't go on any roller coasters. Oh, well then... There's then... loads and loads of rides that aren't roller coasters okay. at Disney. there you go. You... Well, well, There's cool. potential. I'm like, really would like to do a me, you and Kathy trip to Disneyland in Paris. <laughs> I feel like that would be... I mean, you would be seeing me at my absolute happiest. Mm. And for that reason alone, it would probably be beautiful because it would be a... It would be a display of autistic joy, right? I do love displays of autistic joy. So yeah, I think when we talk about defining friendships outside of neurotypical standards, what that looks like is up to you. But I think it's basically about recognising when you feel like you need to behave in a certain way in a friendship. Is it a case of respect and boundaries? In which case, yes, do that. Or is it a case of because, because society says this is how we should do this? And if it is just because society says this is how we do this, but actually both parties would be fine with it not being that way, then, you know, try different ways. Explore different ways of connecting with people. Yeah, I'd also like to add in terms of navigating challenging situations and, like, situations where you've been hurt by someone um, or you've both been, you've both hurt each other. And we kind of, we had that recently. And... Sometimes there's this narrative of, oh, yeah, you've got to fix it. You've got to apologise. You've got to say sorry. And sometimes that's really hard when that hurt has initially happened. And so what happened with us is we tried to have that conversation, but both of us, because the reason that like we, 
we, we kind of hurt each other was that we were both really overwhelmed and both really overstimulated. And so we weren't actually in the place where we could have that conversation. And so instead, like we tried to have it, it didn't work. And then just instead of like, either ignoring each other and taking space which or, is the standard which is the standard and then that can like lead to a fracture that continues or like try and keep trying to have that conversation and then just getting into more conflict which is another way we just went ah oh, let's just send each other gifts and like go back and like build back some of that like safe space within the friendship and then like a few weeks down the line when we were both in a better place we had the conversation about what happened and how to have that not happen in future yeah there is no there are no rules for how to conflict solve within a friendship and the whole like pattern of yeah like disappear go into your own life and and miss your friend is just feels less healthy than how we handled it really yeah i hope you found this video helpful i know that i have mm. it's always nice to sit and have a chat with you um if you did don't forget to like the video. The best and most helpful thing you can do for my channel and me as a creator is to subscribe to my channel and I will see you next time. Goodbye.